so yeah so um as we were talking uh last time the uh bandwidth is pretty much the range of frequencies through which we can send uh signals right so uh in data communication in the physical layer our main goal is to send signals through some medium whether it's cable or air right so when we want to send multiple signals through one cable um we have a problem then so and i gave this example last time but i think it's worth to giving it again so for example if i want to send some voice data right the human voice has frequencies or uh bandwidth between so the frequencies are between zero and four hertz right so the bandwidth is four hertz but as i said the human voice has four uh zero to four hertz frequencies so let's say if i want to send through one cable multiple uh human voices multiple messages each of which has human voice okay then all of those signals are going to be from zero to four hertz so they're gonna interact with each other so we cannot do that if we send multiple messages so we need to do something about it right and that's why today we're going to talk about multiplexing this is basically a way uh, with which we can send multiple signals through medium without them interfering uh, with each other okay and uh, so as you can see here on the left side we have the multiplexer okay and there are multiple signals coming to the multiplexer then something is happening there right uh, after that as you can see those signals are getting combined into a signal signal then then they're transmitted to the through the link and after that they are demultiplexed when we receive them okay so there are a few ways to multiplex signals and this is through frequency division multiplexing uh, which means that each of the inputs that we get okay as in the same way that i showed you last time uh, we increase the frequencies of some of the signals we reduce the frequencies of some other signals in a way that they don't interact with themselves okay we also have the uh, time division multiplexing where we just schedule which signal is sent when so they don't interact and also we have the wavelength division multiplexing which is very similar to the frequency division and i'll explain you later okay it's not going to be too hard all right yeah and actually um, you can see those here so the frequency in the wavelength division is very common for the analog signals right for continuous signals uh, while the time division multiplexing is more for digital signals this doesn't mean that uh, those techniques are used specifically for analog and digital signals because you know you can convert analog to digital and digital to analog okay so okay let's see the first technique okay so uh the first technique the frequency division multiplexing is usually applied when our channel cable or air um, has higher bandwidth than the frequencies available okay so for example uh, we talked about the human voice right um, so for example if we have a cable with bandwidth of 8 hertz and the human voice has 4 hertz this means that we can do a frequency division multiplexing uh, and actually send two voice messages through one channel uh, one of the messages we're gonna keep it from 0 to 4 hertz while the other one we're going to shift it with the frequency division multiplexing and we're going to make it from uh, 4 to 8 hertz okay um, it's also important um, to keep some uh, gap between the uh, different uh, frequencies right 
So normally, uh, if you want to send, let's say, two messages through a cable that has eight uh, hertz bandwidth, you actually would probably need a little bit higher bandwidth. Let's say you would need a nine hertz cable, right? And then you have one message zero, zero to four and the other one five to nine. So you leave some gap in between them, okay? Um, yeah, and um, this gap is called uh, guard bands, okay? Those are those nine five bands, okay? You need some difference between those. Okay, and so on the left side, you can see the, uh, the actual multiplexing uh, process, right? So you have, for example, here three signals. Then you use some um, carrier signal right here that has different frequency, okay? Then you modulate the initial signal with the signal that has some specific frequency that you want to send, right? And this is the resultant signal. After that, all the sources, you can combine them into one composite signal that you send through the link, okay? So as you can see, it's uh, not very difficult. Okay, yes, and yeah, here you can see it a little bit bigger, but we're not gonna get over it. Okay, so uh, here you can see a very simple example of the frequency division multiplexing. So, uh, for example, if we have three uh, phone, three phone lines that want to communicate with three phone lines in another city, right? The way that they can communicate is that. As I said, our voice will be 0 to 4 hertz, right? And let's say our link has uh, frequencies available from 20 to 32 hertz, right? So what we're going to do here, firstly, the first signal is going to go through a modulator. So we're going to increase the frequency of the signal from 20 to 24 hertz. The second one, we're going to increase um, 24 to 28 and the last one 28 to 32 then we're going to combine the signals send them through the link and here we're going to get a bandpass filter which is pretty much the multiplexer what we're doing is uh, simply separating the uh, composite signal uh, into the signals that reach the final destination so let's turn it here oops <coughs> okay, uh, and here is another example. Okay, uh, so here is another example. Let's say um, if we have five channels, uh, each of which uh, needs 100 hertz bandwidth and we want to multiplex them together. I can ask you, for example, on the test, what is the minimum bandwidth of a link that we need, right? What link do we need in order to send all of those um, channels uh, or signals, right, uh, through the same link? So obviously, we will need at least 500 hertz for all of those signals. Uh, and then we can also add uh, 10 hertz in between them. So the final uh, bandwidth that we will need is 540 hertz. Okay, so now if you understood already the frequency division multiplexing, then the wavelength division multiplexing is also not going to be uh, very difficult for you. Uh, so, have you heard about fiber optic cables? You've heard? Okay, uh, so if you've heard, probably you know that uh, those cables uh, transmit data in a very fast way, right? Those are 
pretty much the, the, the cables used for the fastest data transmission, okay? And there we're actually using the uh, wavelength division multiplexing. And do you know why they're called fiber optics cable? Yes, so yes, the material is fiber, exactly. And optics, why optics? Because the light reflects, gets totally internal reflection or something like the cable. Yes, yes, pretty good. So exactly, uh, fiber because this is the material obviously, and optics because we're sending uh, optics signals through them. Um, okay, somebody, yeah, come in. Yeah, and optics because we send optic signals through them, which are uh, the signals that transmit that transmit data in the fastest way, right? Since they travel with the speed of light. Uh, okay, so in order for us to cope with those types of signals, this is why we need wavelength division multiplexing. is the same like the frequency division multiplexing, but here we just have uh, multiple uh, input signals, right, that are combined together, where we combine the uh, different um, lengths of the signal, different wavelengths. So obviously every optical signal that has different color, the different color comes from the different wavelengths, right? So if we send signals with different colors, we can combine uh, those signals into one and then transmit it through the link. Okay, and here for the multiplexer and demultiplexer, we're using one instrument from physics that is very popular for dealing with light that can disperse the light, you know, and merge together. Yeah, we use prism. Okay, and here is the idea. So within those cables, uh, you're having uh, a very very small prisms between them right and what they are used for obviously to combine the signals together right then we transmit the resultant signal through the fiber optics cable and then we have another prism on the other side in the demultiplexer uh, so we get the uh, individual signals right and here uh, you can see a very good illustration of that, right? So if we send multiple lights through a prism, it can combine them to one and also the other way around, okay? And also this is, as you can see, uh, the fiber optics cable, okay? So this is pretty much the lowest level of data communications. This is the way that we transmit uh, the actual data and signals from one place to another. Okay, so um, when we are dealing with uh, digital signals, there is another very popular way uh, to multiplex signals, right? Uh, in order to send them through a link. And this is the time division multiplexing. So if in the frequency division, we were uh, separating frequency within the cable, so we were sharing frequency, here we're sharing time. So in that situation, each signal um, can take the full bandwidth of our transmission medium, but uh, our multiplexer and demultiplexer is able to schedule the signal so, so they are uh, sent in a synchronized way at different times, okay? And as I mentioned, this is the most popular for uh, digital signals, but again, you can easily convert analog to digital signal and then use exactly the same method to transmit your signal. Okay, and I will also want to show you an example of um, the time division multiplexing. So this is used for the telephone lines. 
right so uh, I don't know if you heard but maybe not because uh, you're young even me I haven't uh, used this that much yeah come in but the uh, telephone line services are divided into uh, four different services those are DS0, DS1, DS2 and DS3 okay and those services are pretty much as you can see uh, multiple signals arriving to the time division multiplexer getting combined to one so this is the DS0 then all the signals that come from multiple time division multiplexers they go to the DS1 and they get multiplexed again and so on and so on until we reach the DS4 service okay so this is a very common methodology to transmit data for the uh, telephone network okay okay so uh, so far we're talking about how we uh, transmit signals mainly those techniques that I explained to you are used to transmit signals through uh, cables right because there you don't have any other interactions from intruders right because all the information you send through the cable is going to be just through it okay however uh, we are getting a very big problem in um, data transmission in the physical layer when we want to se send signals wireless or through a Wi-Fi network right so uh, the main problem there is if I want to say send a signal tr to what's your name okay so if I want to send a signal to Amar uh, through air right and my signal has let's say a frequency of uh, 10 Hertz right there can be some intruder that also uses the same frequency and change my message right uh, they can modify it and then send it to him so maybe um, I send some message to him but maybe he gets something completely different or even worse uh, some message that gives him a very wrong information right and he cannot uh, and we cannot communicate properly so this means that we need a different way uh, to send signals when we use Wi-Fi and this is where it comes the uh, spread spectrum okay so in the spread spectrum uh, we're also using or we're also trying to change uh, the bandwidth of to use the full bandwidth and to change the frequencies of our signal but here our goal is a little bit different so let's say if our signal uh, has frequency let's say 4 Hertz what we want to do is to spread this frequency to multiple frequencies okay so let's say if I have a frequency of 4 Hertz I want to use 40 Hertz and divide my signal into multiple signals for more security and I will explain you how this is done okay so you understand this when I explain you the uh, frequency hopping spread spectrum okay uh, so the idea here is that we don't send the full message using only one frequency what we want to do is to send some small portion of our message using one frequency then we want to send some small portion using other frequency and in that way to change from one to another frequency over and over again that way if there is an intruder okay and somehow he catches one of our frequencies he will just get a very small portion of our message not only this but also for this intruder to be able to uh, completely trick us right and change our message the intruder also needs to know the sequence of frequencies that we're using right he needs to know the next frequency we jump to 
Okay, and here is how the technique works. So here, uh, in this device right here, we're generating a fault. So this is a fault generator. Okay, so we're going to generate, uh, let's say, some uh, bits, different bits that are going to be assigned to specific frequency. So for example, uh, let me show you actually the next picture, I think I have it exactly how it looks. Yes. Okay. So you can see that right here, we are generating a bit pattern, which is not very complicated because simply, let's say we have the number 101, right? And we know that the number 101 is assigned to 702 hertz frequency. Okay. So we're going to use this fault generator to match some specific patterns here with some specific frequencies. Okay. And if I go back to the previous figure, okay, the idea is that uh, once we have our original signal, okay, and then our original signal passes through this device here, the modulator, the modulator already has the frequency which we're going to use. Okay, and how this happens. So firstly, here we choose a specific number, for example, uh, 101. This specific number is corresponding to frequency of 600 hertz. Okay, so we choose this frequency from the table here. After that, we pass through the frequency uh, synthesizer which basically generates our carrier frequency and this is what we pass here. And this process repeats over and over again, right, for every portion of the message. Okay, so since, um, okay, so for now what we know is that if we want to send a message through air from point A to point B. Let's say if the message uh, uses one frequency, right? We need to make this message use maybe 10 more frequencies just for this signal me single message. So what's the disadvantage there? Okay, let me show somebody. Are you on the back row? What do you think? What's the disadvantage when we use so many frequencies to send a sig single message. Uh, the big delay in images. The what? Delay in images. It cannot be tempered. No. It cannot be what? Tempered. The message cannot be tempered. Okay. Like if there is an intruder, uh, if there is one frequency, we can map to that frequency and change the message. But if we have multiple frequency, it's difficult. It's difficult to identify. Yeah. So he cannot change the message. Yes which is the advantage but so what is the to, um, get each message on the other side um, not really because also the receiver would have exactly the same code so uh, the receiver will know what frequency to get but Isn't there a faster process? Yeah, faster no okay actually it's more simple you're overthinking <laughs> <laughs> it's more simple I mean, obviously, when uh, a single message that uses one frequency, instead of one, we use 10 frequencies, obviously, we take additional bandwidth, which is not efficient, right? Because if I take 10 frequencies, but I use only one at a time, right? The other nine, they're not used by anything, okay? So they, they're going to be free because I'm always going to switch between those, right? I'm not going to use all at the same time. I will use only one at the time okay so because of that uh, there is another technique called bandwidth sharing okay so we can actually share right those frequencies that we already use okay and you can see here the example in a very simple way so here is the frequency division multiplexer where we just share the frequencies so let's say a color means a different message or a different channel, right? So here we have one frequency dedicated for the whole 
channel always okay and this is when we send the electrical cable right so when we want to do this layer in order for us to use all the frequencies what we're going to do is uh we're going to have some schedule for the uh different portions of the message right so at frequency one at some time we're going to send message one then message two then message three then message four okay and also we're going to all exchange with the time right so this is going to jump from here to, to here to here this message is also going to jump from frequency to frequency that way the frequencies are not getting wasted over time right and we can use still the full spectrum and the full bandwidth but we're adding some very uh, strong level of security in that case make sense yeah okay okay so there is another technique to uh spread the spectrum so spread spectrum means that we're actually adding uh either more frequencies or more information so uh, our message is transferred in a more secure way right so the other way is by direct um, sequence spread spectrum okay uh, and this method is mainly used for digital data as you can see okay and our idea here is if we get a very simple signal that is so a digital signal can be on multiple levels right uh, we have two level signal ones and zeros right so instead of sending this signal okay we can actually combine it with some additional signal that is called the spreading code right and by passing this original signal through our spreading code we're generating a brand new signal that carries exactly the same logic right so we repeat the same pattern for one and for zero as you can see but in that way since uh, our signal in that case is more complex right uh, it is way more secure uh, when we send it and this is called a uh, baker sequence and as you can see for every bit into our signal we're adding 11 additional bits okay and we're getting a resultant signal right here those additional bits are called chips as we can see here so what we have is our original signal passing through the modulator this is exactly what's happening inside the modulator okay um, and after that the signal is transmitted to the uh, receiver right so now we have the spread signal okay um, so even though for um, the past two lectures we were talking um, for the physical layer uh, today also we're going to cover switching uh, which is actually applicable to a few layers, right? So we're going to talk about the different ways um, of switching. So who can tell me what is switching? Like brief, switching. So when we use a switch to communicate... Operator connectivity. To what? Operator connectivity or to operate anything. Y yeah, so, okay. In networking, there is, a, there is one thing called switch. So what happens is when we have some like physical layer, whatever the network packet is sent from one, uh, you know, one router or switch to another. Okay. Like, which like basically it do the multiplexing kind of thing to translate physical layer data into you know the next layer like uh, physical layer. Like okay. Physical layer to switch layer. Right. Application layer. Uh, okay. Okay. Close. So switches. So uh, make a connection between uh, multiple devices. Like to make a connection between multiple devices. Yes. Like okay. Simple yes. translation thing. Like it translates from one form of data to another form of data. Like it reads the packet net uh, fragments, mm -hmm. headers and stuff, and translates data into you know another layer. 
okay good good so yeah uh you you bring uh, very good points and when we combine those points we can actually answer the question yes so uh switching is used for communication between devices right um it's it's working in multiple layers like you said um and switching can work in the physical it can work in the data link layer uh, in the networking layer and even in the application layer okay uh, w uh, the work in sw uh, for switching in the application layer these days is not uh, used that uh, that much like before uh, but we mainly use the switches in the physical and the data link layer okay um, have you seen an actual switch device how it looks like more or less you've seen uh, box and with multiple ports right and to those ports what you do you connect multiple devices right and when you connect those devices to this box uh, and you also plug your computer to this box what's happening you can actually communicate with the devices right you don't need internet you don't need anything you can just communicate and how you're going to communicate uh, each device will have a specific IP address local to the to the switch and you can just provide this IP address and assess the device okay this is how uh, you can do even a home network right you just need to get this box connect connect all of your computers devices printers you have at home and here here you have your home network with IP addresses and so on so yes switches are used for communication between devices and the thing is that of course if we connect one device to another always and we don't use a switch obviously we'll need plenty of cables it's way easier to simply uh, connect the devices to a switch or if you can see from this figure here it's even easier to connect our devices to a network of switches so if i have one switch with uh, 16 ports for example and i connect this switch to another switch that also have 16 ports then you have 32 ports and you can connect 32 devices together and in that way if you have a network of switches with thousands and thousands of ports one device can communicate to all the rest of the devices that are part of this network that's why switching is so important and also uh, the big tech companies are having huge huge facilities just with switches and servers so they can handle their services right this is the idea okay so yes uh, we're going to talk as you can see about switching and i will show you some uh, different techniques and methods of switching as well as we're going to talk about switching in different layers this is why i'm saying that even though we're talking about physical layer since i want to cover switching and compare the different types of switching we're also going to touch other layers as well okay okay so those are the different types of switching that we're going to talk in a little bit more detail so we have uh, circuit switching packet switching which can be uh, virtual circuit uh, circuit switching and data ground switching and also we have message, message switching which we're not going to talk about today since as i said it is used in the application layer but it is not very common today so of course uh, i don't want to give you something that you might not use right uh, okay so first question where do we use in which layer would we use circuit switching just try it. i know that you might not be familiar but uh, which I layer i just think that it's just similar to a clock switch when we have a telephone and like you can only talk in one way okay uh, telephone line like can be old time is an example of circuit switching like we have a dedicated connection between two switches so we do have yes packet switching is like we are sending packets multiple packets yes Mm -hmm. and the switch is gonna read and transfer it to that machine 
yes correct we do have dedicated path for the circuit switching and uh, this is the most common uh, type of switching for the physical layer okay because here we have a dedicated path uh, the packet switching is more popular um, for the data link layer and for the networking layer actually let me show you here i think i have it yes so yeah the data um, the packet switching is for the data link and the network layer okay uh, and for the application layer we have the um, message switching okay so in all of those layers that you can see in front of you we're having switching in one way or the other okay so obviously the first thing that we're going to talk about uh, is about the circuit switching okay so first of all those triangles here those are multiplexers and demultiplexers you were going to say that yes. right okay i said yeah so those are multiplexers and demultiplexers so understand why it makes sense that i first explain you how we multiplex and demultiplex signals and then we move to switching because this is a very important part of switching. Here you can see switches, okay? And the idea is, out of the switch or inside the switch, we have it multiple ports. To each port, we send message or we send signal, right? The idea is to multiplex those signals together in order to go to the next switch or device, right? And uh, this is how it all works. So now you understand this screen right here on how the switches are connected. Okay. So in the circuit switching, we have a few stages in order for us to be able to exchange information. Okay. So firstly, we have the uh, setup phase. Okay, so uh, firstly, we have the setup phase where we establish the connection between the source and the destination. So what the source needs to do, it needs uh, to send a request message. This message has the address of the receiver. And once the message is received from the receiver, the receiver also has to do something, right? it needs to respond and say that, okay, I am here and we can connect. So the receiver needs to acknowledge that uh, we can establish connection. So once the setup phase is completed and done, then we take the resources from the switching network, okay? So we take the uh, channels between the different switches and we take the specific ports at each switch now they are dedicated for uh, our communication nobody else can use them until we finish the communication and all the messages are transferred okay um, after that we start the next phase and actually here i listed all the phases okay after that we start with the data transfer phase which is pretty much exchanging the information that we want to exchange. And finally, once this is completed, then we can uh, tear down the connection. So we close our connection. And this is how uh, our job is done, right? The job of the switching network is completed. Okay. And here you can see our example with the phones that want to interact with each other, right? So those four phones here want to interact with uh, two phones at one location and two phones at another location. In order for them to be able to communicate, they need to pass through a circuit switch network in order to get connected to each other. So as you can see here, phone one and two, okay are connected to uh seven and eight okay and the whole process would be let's say if phone one wants to communicate with uh, phone eight what it needs to do is 
send a request, getting a response. Uh, then the signal that comes from the phone, which is from 0 to 4 kilohertz, is going to be multiplexed, so it fits to that bandwidth of the channel. Okay, And this is how we're going to establish the communication in the circuit switch network. Okay, and here is an, another example. Okay, so in that case, um, we're having a few computers, okay, that want to communicate with each, with each other, right? They're located in two offices uh, that are separate from each other. And what we have here, the four of those computers are connected to a switch. And the switch has um, four inputs and eight outputs so the inputs are going to be connected to the computers right and the outputs so four of the outputs are going to get back to the office so the computers in the same office can communicate between themselves so they're all connected to this switch here as i mentioned before on how you can make a local connections between devices while the four other ports are going to get multiplexed into this T line. It's just a link between our switch and the switch of the other office. And in the other office, we're going to have exactly the same situation. Okay, this is how they can communicate. Actually, let me hide this for now, so I ask you. So, um, a question for you. What do you think is this way of sending messages efficient, for example, comparing to the packet switch network, let's say. So, is this way of transmitting messages ha having higher efficiency or lower efficiency? Higher efficiency means that we can use 100% of the resources at all times. Lower efficiency means that we cannot use 100% of our resources and links all the time. Packet switching is not efficient. Why? Because uh, you are not using like the phone, uh, like, you know, physical layer or every time. Yes, it's true. Yes, correct. But in packet switching, uh, like a lot of messages will be sending alongside so like it's more efficient okay yes and you can connect as many uh, ports from each switch you want correct but yes switching, they have to add a physical layer like uh, you know the wires dedicated wires and stuff mm -hmm. so yeah not efficient. yeah so it is i mean we cannot say exactly not efficient but I actually if we compare it with other networks is it has lower efficiency right so uh yeah that's correct the reason why uh the efficiency of the circuit switch network is not that high is just because we are actually taking the resources from for ourselves right and we don't release those resources until we finish the communication uh, if you're talking with somebody on a land phone right uh, this might be okay because you want to keep the conversation all the time but if you want to communicate between different devices sometimes computers can be connected between themselves even though they don't exchange messages at all right so in that way you're going to take the resources uh, to communicate between two computers but you're not actually going to use them so that's why the efficiency is low right we can say that the circuit switch network has low efficiency now how about the delay what do you think does it have high delay well actually i think i wrote it there right okay so i will just tell you so the delay here is uh almost not existing and the reason is because we already took the resources right we don't need to wait for absolutely anything uh, when we send the message, we have a specific path. We don't wait before or after a switch. We just send and receive the message. The only delays that we're going to have are going to be for the setup phase, right? And for the teardown phase. 
So until we establish the connection, there is going to be some delay, but our individual messages, once we establish the connection, um, they're going to be transmitted with a very low delay. So put this in mind uh, when we move to the uh, packet switch network. Okay. All right. So in the packet switch network, instead of dedicated resources for uh, sending messages from source to the destination, we're breaking the message into small packets. Okay, and those packets they can arrive to the destination at different times. We can so if we break actually let me show you another figure. Okay. So those packets can actually arrive at different times. Uh, one type of um, the packet switch network is the datagram network, where those packets are actually called datagrams, which are small portions of data, small portions of the message that we want to send. And why do they arrive in a different order? So we send first, second, third, fourth packet, right? But in the end, they can arrive in a completely different way. So this is because uh, here it really depends on the availability of the switches. Actually, uh, because the packet switch um, networking is happening in the data link and in the network layer, here the switches are actually routers, right? So in the packet switch network, we're using routers which are routing the packets through one device to another or through the next router in the sequence. Okay, so uh, obviously here there will be more delay because we use the resources on demand. So once we send a packet, if um, switch one has an available port through which it can send our um, data datagram or packet, it does it. But if the bandwidth of that link through which we want to send the packet is busy, then it's going to route it through another line, through another switch. Okay, and this is why when we send the first packet um, and the first packet fills and takes the bandwidth of the link, then the next packet might take a completely different route. And this is why in the end they can arrive in not exactly the same sequence. Okay. Okay. So you might ask yourself then how, so if we don't establish a hard link between the sender and the receiver, how do we know um, where to send the packet actually, right? We, we need to obtain this information somehow. And in order for us to do that, oops, um, each switch has something called uh, has uh, something called routing table. Okay, so this routing table is very dynamic, but it holds two very important pieces of information. So it holds holds the destination address, so where we want to deliver our packet and also holds the output port. So the router decides where to send our message. And after it decides, it assigns a specific output port, whether it's going to be through another router or it's going to be to the destination. Okay. And this is how they know how to route the packet. Okay, so uh, what do you think here? What is going to be the efficiency? Obviously, it's going to be better, right? Because we're using our resources on demand, which means that um, we're going to hit a link as long as we have bandwidth. So if we don't have enough bandwidth, we're just going to go through another link. So this means that we always utilize our resources as much as we can. Okay, this is another one. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so how about the delay? Are we going to have more or less delay? And also where are we going to have a delay if we do have? Any suggestions? What do you think? So, le so let's say, you know, we have multiple routers, right? And we send the packet through multiple routers and we can only send the packet from router to router if we have available bandwidth. If we don't have, we might send from our link or we might have to wait because sometimes we just don't have there links. Is no delay. There is no delay because mm -hmm. every router is gonna leave the destination address and from that he has to like they'd have to be like you know an algorithm to determine yeah. what is the shortest path, like a Jista or something. Mm -hmm. Like calculating the other nodes, like which is the shortest path. First this this would be the you know, first delay, second uh, reading the header and then again, you know, packing that message in another header like and sending it to another router. So this mm -hmm. is gonna happen like I mean all the nodes, all the routers. So Yeah. Uh, so delay. yeah, in that case, and yeah, every so router will have its own delay. Gets, if a message gets corrupted, so that is also like can be a delay. Yeah, so yeah, this is also true, uh, but it's also true for the cir circuit switch network because if the message is interrupted also there uh, and you use TCP protocol in the transport layer, you will try to send a message again, right? This is what uh, you mean, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Uh, so yeah, here, of course, as you said, guys, it's going to be more delay uh, because we're going to have delay at every router uh, and sometimes messages who just need to wait at a router until a link is available because not always we're going to have available links and this is one reason why sometimes when there is more traffic through your network even through your internet if there is more traffic obviously your internet gets slower right because the packets need to wait and they get to the destination later Okay, <coughs> so finally there is another type of network which pretty much combines the positives of the circuit switch and the packet switch network and this is called the virtual circuit network. Okay, so uh, here we have a similarity to the circuit switch network because we're having a dedicated path uh, between the sender and the receiver when we send our messages. We have similarity to the packet switch network because we're sending packets. We're not sending the full messages through that link, right? Um, so, for this reason, this is a unique type of network and yeah, come in. Hello, hello guys, come in. So, as I said, this is a unique type of network combining both um, of those switching networks. And I will explain you how it works. So, now, in order for this type of switching to work, uh, firstly, we need something called global addresses, okay? Which means that every device that we connect to that network will have a unique identifier, okay? Uh, also, we're going to have a virtual circuit identifier, which is a number that identifies, that identifies each device in the network M in uh, the most of the situations this is the switch right because we just uh, pass through a web of switches okay the idea for the global addresses is for them uh, to be used in the setup phase so we can obtain the virtual secret identifiers okay and you can see that 
when you have a data that travels to a switch, we have the message right here, but also to the message, we attach the unique switch identifier so we know exactly where we want to send our message. Okay? Once we go to the switch, the switch assigns another identifier. Okay? And then we have the information for the next switch. Okay? So how this is done? 